All right, well, thank you, Jean-Pierre, for having me here, and thank you to all of you for coming. Um, so, so like Jean-Pierre said, uh, I've, just, I've prepared what I think is an hour, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to go slower so that we can bleed over to the next section. And also, I encourage more questions from you during this hour um, so that, you know, we have time to, to go everything over everything in some detail. All right, so I was asked to give an introduction to superconductivity. And as was pointed out, this is not something that's easy to do in an hour. Uh, and I was told to keep it somewhat simple, and so the beginning part will be kind of simple, almost cartoonish. But then as we go on, I'm going to try to get some more substance into the lecture, and in the end, try to give you a flavor for what's going on today uh, in terms of uh, interest in, in, in these materials. All right, so let's begin first looking at what we know about conventional superconductors. And then we'll turn to unconventional superconductors to see the difference between those and the conventional materials. All right, so here's the required slide to put on first. Here's a picture of Cameron Onis, and he was able to, uh, he was the first to cool down to um, very low temperature, and he saw that the resistance in mercury uh, dropped to zero below a critical temperature. And so this was the first sign of superconductivity, zero resistance, and this was discovered in 1911, and then maybe 20 years later, Meisner and Ostenfeld saw that if you apply, have a magnetic field, and the material goes superconducting, the magnetic field is expelled from the superconductor like this. So the, so the magnetic induction inside the superconductor is zero, and you may have seen pictures of this. This is what allows a magnet to levitate on top of a, a, a superconductor. Right. And one thing to point out, and which was realized also early on, is that M the Meissner effect is not a consequence of this perfect conductivity, and that's easy to see from Maxwell's equations. So in particular, if we have a perfect conductor, then we all know that E is zero. And so then, if we imagine, we look at Maxwell's equation for del B del T, we see that's given by the curl of E, and since E is zero, this must be zero. And so if we start with a field configuration like this, and we go into a superconductor, we expect this field configuration to be the same if we had a perfect conductor. So the Meissner effect is telling us that there's something more happening than uh, simply perfect conductivity. Right. And it was a mystery. It was uh, not understood for a long time why this happened. Um, and in fact, a lot of people asked. It was unexplained for 46 years, and many famous people tried to explain it. And there's some notable examples. So, Pauli tried, um, he, and he, he gave up. He couldn't find an explanation. Feynman also tried, but was unable to come up with an explanation. And also I tried, but I was unable to come up with an explanation as well. Okay, well, that was, that was my joke, but, um, yeah, I might do that, actually, because I do realize I'm moving over quite a bit, right? You just got to plug it in. Where's the, oops. Well, maybe it's in the last computer? Oh, okay. Um, well, I, I can go on like this. It's here. Oh, it's there, okay. There it is, okay. Yeah, I got USB here. All right. Okay. All right, thanks. All right, so in 1957, the explanation was, was found, and that was by Bardeen, Cooper, and Schrieffer. And this theory had essentially two ingredients, which I'm uh, saying in a very qualitative way. But the first ingredient is that two electrons bind to form a molecule. Right. And the second ingredient is that these molecules, these are now bosons, they bose condense. Right. This is very qualitative and not an accurate description, but it helps to form a picture. So what I'm going to be talking about 
in the next slide is a little bit about the, pro the Bose condensation properties of a superconductor. And then later I'm going to spend a lot of time on discussing about how two electrons bind to form a molecule and the implications of that in superconductivity, which is something that we, have a, we, we pay a lot of attention to now. All right. So the idea that we get a Bose condensate means that in a superconductor we have a macroscopic wave function. So inside our material, across the whole material, we have a wave function. And importantly, that wave function has a magnitude and a phase. And because of this phase, above the superconducting transition temperature, there is no set phase. All phases are equivalent. Below it, we have a particular choice of phase. And so it was understood by Ginsburg and Landau that this was a phase transition that broke a symmetry. And so it could be explained by some effective theory called Ginsburg-Landau theory, where we have a symmetry breaking, and that symmetry breaking is this breaking of gauge symmetry. And so Ginsburg and Landau, indeed, did write down a theory for this. They wrote some free energy, so this is a thermodynamic free energy that depends on the magnitude of this wave function. It depends only on the magnitude because it has to describe the symmetry preserving phase and the symmetry broken phase. And in the symmetry preserving phase, your free energy cannot depend on the phase and so it can only depend on the magnitude of this phase. And the simplest realization of this, this is this, this, you describe this by a Taylor series, understanding that above TC, this uh, magnitude is zero, and below TC it starts to grow continuously from zero, so we can do some sort of Taylor series expansion. And the lowest two terms in this Taylor series expansion are these two here. And we describe the phase transition through this parameter. We say that above TC this is positive, and below TC this becomes negative, and this parameter B is just positive. So what does that mean? Well, it means that we look at this free energy. Above TC, we see the minimum of this free energy sits at the magnitude of psi being zero. And so we minimize this free energy to describe the superconducting state. And so above TC, we find that there is no order. But then once this becomes negative, we find this minimum moves off to some finite value of psi. And that describes a superconducting state. What this predicts then is that you get some characteristic growing of the order parameter below TC. And again, uh, you find a fixed phase inside the superconducting material, and so you have a broken U1 gauge symmetry. Now, Ginsburg and Landau went further. They also allowed for the possibility that this wave function can spatially vary. And so they introduced this spatially varying term, which looks a lot like the kinetic energy you might see in a Schrodinger type equation. And in it then they said this vector D has a spatial variation plus some uh, vector potential term that you would see from, say, a canonical momentum in classical mechanics or in, in, qu well, in quantum mechanics. Right. And then if you have magnetic fields, by the way, this appears because the superconducting condensate comes from charged 2e electrons, and so it is charged, and so you have to allow for this vector potential term to appear. And then you have to allow for the fact that it costs energy to have spatial variations, and this is just the magnetic field term. So if you turn on magnetic field, del cross A is B. I'm not going to go into the details, but with this addition, um, Ginsburg and Landau were able to explain the Meissner effect, and then Abrikosov later was able to explain the existence of vortices by adding this. And the big, um, I think one of the big uh, interesting aspects of the development of this theory was the fact that they chose to put a charge or it was found that you need a charge 2E here, not a charge E, which told you that pairs of electrons were important, not single electrons. Right. So this is what I'm going to say about the um, macroscopic description, or the Bose condensate. Now I'm going to start to turn to Cooper pairs, but what I want you to remember throughout this talk then is that these Cooper pairs are basically going to be molecules, and these molecules will both condense, and we're going to look, uh, and so it's going to be closely linked to this macroscopic picture. All right, so what Bardeen, Cooper, and Schrieffer were able to figure out was first how two electrons can make a molecule. And here's a cartoon picture of this, but the question is interesting because two electrons, we know they have charge E, so they're going to repel each other. So how on earth can you make a bound state of two electrons? Well, they realize that electrons and materials don't exist by themselves. They exist in the background of a, a, a sea of positive ions. 
And so the, the explanation they came up in a cartoonish way is the following. You have one electron that comes into the sea of positive ions. It draws those ions near to it, and then, a set, and then it scoots away. But these ions stay collected like this and creates a region of sort of net positive charge that a second electron sees and gets attracted to this. And this creates an, uh, uh, an attraction between this first and second electron that allows Cooper pairs to be formed. But these Cooper pairs are very large objects sitting over many, many lattice spacings. So that's why this picture of a Bose condensate isn't exactly correct, because at the transition temperature of a superconductor, you have these large molecules, and they're all very strongly overlapping uh, already at TC. So you form a Cooper pair, and at the same temperature, you get the Bose condensate in most situations. All right, so the Cooper pairs are formed through this um, electron lattice interaction. And here's something I'm going to focus on a lot in this talk, is the notion of uh, Cooper pairs in the context of the underlying Fermi C. Right. So Cooper, so here what I've drawn is uh, a two-dimensional Bruon zone. And I have a Fermi surface, so yellow are occupied states, white are unoccupied states. And what Cooper was able to show was that if you have such a Fermi surface, then if you have an infinitesimally weak attraction between two electrons on this Fermi surface, you're guaranteed to form a bound state. And that meant that superconductivity could happen for arbitrarily small interactions. And the reasons for that I'll get into later or the essential reasons for that we'll get into later, but that was the key insight of Cooper into this. And he, at the time, they also realized that these Cooper pairs are usually spin singlet, so you have an electron spin up and another was spin down and then vice versa, and that's what your Cooper pair is. And these are spatially symmetric. Uh, spatially symmetric also means the momentum space, they're symmetric, and so they're equivalent all around this Fermi surface. So what's important is that you pair this electron and this electron for this K, but you can do that on every K on the Fermi surface. And then these two red lines show the region of electrons that are paired by this interaction. Question. Yeah. Um, so the Cooper pair, the total wave function has to be anti-symmetric, right? So it's not a boson. It is not, uh, okay, yeah, so it's, it's a Cooper pair, and you're right, it's not a boson, but the boson is useful to help understand that indeed we have, um, well, okay, it's, it's a pair of electrons is the right way to describe it. You could describe it. Yeah, I mean, if you make them sufficiently tightly bound, it will be a boson. But because of the spatial extent of these things, it's not a good description to say these are bosons. It's not a Bose condensate, strictly speaking. The BCS instability is different than Bose condensation. All right. So what I'm going to turn to now is I'm going to look at some of the properties of this kind of conventional superconductors, focusing on the anti-symmetric uh, spin structure, and then also the fact that you get Cooper pairing all around this Fermi surface. And that has some immediate implications that have uh, experimental implications that were seen early on. So the first is that you get an energy gap, meaning that these fermions are no longer free to participate in thermodynamics or in transport. You have to break the Cooper pair before you see any of their properties, and so you have this energy gap in here is the density of states versus energy. In the normal Fermi C, you have a constant, approximately constant density of states, and so you have excitations everywhere, but once you form the superconductor, all the states up to the superconducting gap are fully gapped and so can't participate to thermodynamics, and then you get this characteristic square root singularity because suddenly you can break Cooper pairs and at the place you can break them you have many, many states available. And this means that you can see the presence of this gap micro, uh, in certain characteristic behaviors, for example in specific heat. What's important in specific heat is you get this exponential Boltzmann-like behavior in specific heat at very low temperatures. And also, because these are spin singlet Cooper pairs, and I haven't really looked in the detail yet about that, but I will in a bit, you also get some characteristic response to magnetic fields. In particular, here's spin susceptibility 
is just you turn on a small field and you measure the response of the system and that response is characterized by susceptibility. Because we have spin singlet objects, spin singlet carries zero spin, cannot respond to field. That means when you fully form Cooper pairs, you expect to get actually no susceptibility. And so in a superconductor, you expect to see this suppression. <coughs> so here's two characteristic features of conventional superconductors. One is you have uh, this energy gap that you see in many places. And the second is you get this spin susceptibility or this that goes to zero at zero temperatures. Another consequence of the spin singlet superconductivity is that a magnetic field will break Cooper pairs. And the easy way to see that is here I've drawn that same Fermi surface before with no Zeeman field. And now I'm going to add a Zeeman field. So this Fermi surface is actually two Fermi surfaces on top of each other for spin up and spin down electrons. The Zeeman field then splits the energies of those. And you'll get two different Fermi surfaces, one for spin up electrons and one for spin down electrons. And now we want to make Cooper pairs with spin up and spin down, but you can see that they sit at different energies now. And those, because the fact that they sit at different energies means these Cooper pairs have some kinetic energy. And because of that kinetic energy, eventually that kinetic energy gets so large that it doesn't allow superconductivity to exist anymore. And so what we find characteristically is we have a TC, but when we add a field, we find that this TC is suppressed by field. And we can get an estimate for what field suppresses that superconductivity. And that's when the, this Zeeman field, mu b, is approximately the size of the energy gap. At that point, we expect spin singlet superconductivity to be destroyed by a magnetic field. And indeed, that is seen. Here's some data from uh, iron, tellurium, selenium in particular. This behavior here looks very much like what we expect for a uh, spin singlet superconductor where the magnetic field is suppressing superconductivity. OK, so that's another bit of characteristic feature of um, conventional superconductors. And then finally, the one last thing I want to point out, which turned out to be very important when we understood unconventional superconductors, was the Josephson effect. So here, the idea is very simpler, simple. Josephson considered two superconductors, and they're weakly coupled, so there's an insulating barrier between them. And if they're not coupled, then each one would have their own TC, each one would develop their own wave function, and each one would develop their own phase. Uh, which I call phi 1 and phi 2 here. Now we allow them to be weakly coupled and we'll see that we can get some transport of electron between across this insulating barrier. And typically what is seen, oops, typically what is seen is, um, well remarkably what is seen is that for zero applied voltage across this barrier, you find that there is a critical, there's a current that flows. And this was the Josephson current. And it's depicted like this. And this comes from Cooper pair tunneling between the two sides. And here's an experiment from Bob Dine's group on lead where you can clearly see this Josephson current. But then as you get to potential across here that is big enough to allow Cooper pairs to be broken, you start to see single electron tunneling as well. And so you can see that single electrons can tunnel here, but in here you get nothing showing up. What I'm interested in here is this Josephson current. And Josephson was able to show that the current across this junction is given by some critical current times the sign of the phase difference between these two. And because in, if they're not coupled, you'll get any kind of phase showing up between the two. This phase difference is in general not zero, and you'll get a Josephson current. This is important because now, now we have something that can measure the phase of the superconductor, and that'll show up when we look at these uh, more recent set of superconductors we're interested in. Now, what's going to be important when I talk about the newer superconductors is that this critical current has a characteristic behavior if we apply a magnetic field inside this junction. So if I have a magnetic field that's, say, oriented on the normal of this junction coming through the junction, then you find that that magnet magnetic field uh, decreases the critical current in a characteristic Fraunhofer pattern. And in particular, you can see that with zero magnetic field, we get the maximum Josephson current. But then as we apply a field, once we allow about one flux quantum to go through this junction, we find that we suppress the current and we get this characteristic behavior. Right. So that's a prediction for conventional superconductors, and that was uh, typically seen. Yeah? Uh, 
Right. How do you define the phase of the superconductor? Is the phase of the overall wave function? Yeah, the phase. So we imagine, so in this particular picture, our material is described by a single wave function. Right? That wave function is the same everywhere in space, approximately. And that, then you can describe that with a magnitude and a phase. So it's a single phase describing that whole block of material. How, well, okay, so here, how do you vary the phase difference is a very good question, but in practice, you'll get random phases showing up between these two, and you'll be able to see what is the maximum critical currents from that. So you can just repeat the experiment many times, and you'll get a variety of critical currents, and then you'll see that you get a maximum. So it's, it's not necessarily straightforward to manipulate the phase of an individual particle, but there are, there are yeah, I won't go into that in detail. Um, just making sure. Um, so each superconducting block is described by a uh, phase, but uh, I think a few slides back we saw that the phase can vary. As a yeah, so there. When you apply the field or? Yeah, so when you apply a magnetic field, the phase will vary. Okay. Um, so, okay, well, there's a miser state. In the miser state, it's well described by this picture here. So then the magnetic field is completely screened out. And so the only spatial variation you get in the superconductor near the edges of the superconductor, but inside, deep inside the material, it's approximately constant. But then you also get the vortex phase, which I won't be talking about, but then the order parameter spatially varies significantly. Okay, anyhow, so this critical current, we expect to have a certain characteristic behavior with magnetic field, and I didn't go into the details of why that comes about. But you'll see that you can understand some things about the new set of superconductors looking at this. All right. So that was my overview of conventional superconductors. Okay, we have zero resistance and we have Meissner effect. This is generic to all superconductors, even the more modern superconductors. We have some macroscopic wave function uh, that describes the superconducting state, and that's also generic. And then what is not generic is this behavior talking coming down here. Uh, first is we have an energy gap. And in the superconductor I've been describing, in modern language, this is called S-wave, or even more appropriately, it's assigned to a particular representation of a group, so it's called A1G. We see that this is suppressed by a Zeeman field, so once uh, the gap becomes on the order of the magnetic energy, we get a suppression of superconductivity. And a, a, in accordance with that, from the spin singlet nature, we expect zero susceptibility at zero temperature. And then finally, there's a prediction of a Josephson current across a weak link between these two superconductors. Okay, so that was the picture up till, I don't know, somewhere in the 1980s. And then after that, we began to see very different behavior in a whole new class of superconductors. And so this is what I want to turn to next. And this slide's going to take a little while to go through just to show you what happens. So first, Here's a very famous experiment on uh, the coupe rates, a corner junction experiment done at Urbana-Champaign. And so here, there's not just one junction, but there's two junctions around this corner. And what they saw was something unexpected in the sense that here is the Josephson current as a function of magnetic field going through this junction. And here they saw that instead of having the Josephson critical current suppressed by field, it increased by field and then developed this characteristic behavior. So what is the origin of this increase? That can't be explained by the usual theory. And then there was another uh, material that, well, that was found to have interesting behavior. This was discovered a little bit earlier than 1994, but not much earlier. And that was uranium platinum-3. And so here the interesting thing is, if you look at this superconductor, you find here, if you look at specific heat in particular, you find in zero field, so I'm looking down here, you find that you get not just one superconducting transition, but two superconducting transitions. How on earth can you explain this within a theory of superconductivity, or at least a conventional theory of superconductivity? So here you see two specific heat jumps, and if you remember, a jump in specific heat means that you have a second order phase transition, and each time you have a second order phase transition, you're breaking some symmetry, and so you're breaking one symmetry here, you're breaking a second symmetry here. What is the second symmetry that we're breaking in the superconductor? And then also, I told you um, that a characteristic behavior of conventional superconductors is that you get exponent or you get an energy gap. And so you expect all thermodynamic probes to be characteristic of this energy gap, yeah? Could you get like that kind of 
behavior from like a multi-band superconductor, like an S-wave that just has a different transition temperature for a higher band? Yes, so I would say no, and I'll tell you why. Um, so, okay, you can if you consider a very finely tuned S-wave superconductor. In particular, generically, if we have two, if we have two bands and they both have, they're both S-wave, they're generically coupled, right? So I have one order parameter for one, one order parameter for the other. If they're coupled, then what you would expect to see is maybe you get something that has some feature like this, but you wouldn't get a clear jump, you get a smear jump. And as that coupling becomes bigger and bigger, you'd only become get one feature actually. And so only in the very special limit where these two are uncoupled, would you get two specific heat jumps, and you need some very fine tuning for that to actually happen. So that's a good question. Okay, now turning back to this data here. So this is a measurement of, um, penetration depth and so what that is is you put your superconductor inside a magnetic field and then you look in the Meissner state and that magnetic field penetrates the superconductor to some degree and then eventually deep inside the superconductor the magnetic field goes to zero. Right? And so you can measure how far does the superconductivity penetrate and what you expect is that um, it, uh, it in a conventional superconductor, you expect to see, again, this is going to depend on your excitations, your electronic excitations, and you expect to see something that is characterized by an energy gap, which is shown here. So you expect to see something that doesn't really change and is exponentially going to zero down here inside, um, deep inside the superconducting state. So this is very, very far below TC. However, in a whole series of materials, and here I've shown some recent material here from Maryland, um, some yttrium platinum bismuth, you see that this penetration depth has this characteristic linear in temperature dependence, which means that there's low energy excitation sitting around deep inside the superconducting state, and so there's no energy gap. How do we understand that? And then here, uh, the subject of tomorrow's um, simp uh, workshop is uranium tellurium 2. Here you look at the, res the response of this material to magnetic fields, and you look at the magnetic field to which superconductivity survives. And so here, there's, uh, it's an orthorhombic material, so there's three uh, different directions you can apply the magnetic field. If you apply the magnetic field in this so-called A direction, you get something that looks maybe could be explained uh, by a usual theory. In particular, this critical mu mu BB, this critical poly field sits somewhere down here. And you can see that for especially this direction, you see something that survives far, far, far above this poly field. And so now the magnetic field is not destroying the Cooper pairs. The Cooper pairs can still survive. How can we understand that? And then finally, here there's a, uh, it, it was found and this is in Stronthen ruthenate. It was found that as you go below TC, you can see a clear onset of some signal here. What this is measuring is the polar Kerr effect. So you take light as some polarization, you reflect it off your sample, and you see that the polarization changes. And what this change in polarization means is that your superconductor is breaking time reversal symmetry. There's some magnetization associated with the superconducting state, and that's very puzzling because we already expect from conventional superconductors that they're going to expel all magnetic fields. So where on earth is such a magnetization coming from? Right, and so you can see that a whole class of different materials and in fact, this is an oxide, this is a heavy fermion, um, this is a half Heusler. So very different classes of materials, this is also an oxide, are showing behavior that we don't expect from conventional superconductivity. And that tells us we need to understand this a bit better. Okay, so what I'm going to do in the next few slides is I'm going to go develop the theory of Cooper pairs a little bit more carefully and show you where in that theory each of these can be um, explained and I'll just flash them. I won't be able to go to, to, into them in detail, but I'll just flash the explanations as they come along. All right, so this is a very quick slide to give you a feeling for where all this kind of behavior comes from in the first place. And the essential idea is that, you know, in the standard theory of superconductivity for conventional materials, we have an electron-phonon interaction that gives us our Cooper pairs. But it turns out the electron-phonon interaction competes with Coulomb repulsion, and sometimes the Coulomb repulsion gets to be too large to allow those standard S-wave Cooper pairs to form. And uh, you can show actually that if you have a very strong on-site Coulomb repulsion, 
And I, I won't go into details, but you can treat this um, Coulomb repulsion as a mean field theory term. You can calculate the energy it contributes to superconductivity. And if you make this Coulomb repulsion infinitely large, then you cannot get any, you, 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 it's only a positive energy, which is positive infinite. And that gives you a constraint on the superconducting wave function. And in particular, you find that um, there is a constraint that comes from this, and that is the sum over all k, delta of k must be zero. And that's what Coulomb repulsion tells you. And if you remember, in the previous pictures, I was showing you a superconducting gap that forms all around the Fermi surface. So here, just to be clear, delta of k, I'm now referring to a gap, to a Cooper pair formed between this electron and this electron. And now this gap can depend on k as we move around the Fermi surface. So in the previous case, I had what is known as an S-wave superconductor. And in that case then, um, the, the gap was constant all around the Fermi surface. And so this condition is clearly violated. The sum over k, delta of k, is not zero, it's some finite number. So what that tells you is that this Coulomb repulsion means that the usual S-wave superconductor is unstable. Right. Yeah? So when you say S-wave, you're talking sort of Sorry, what was that? The you're, you're talking about S wave as in sort of like a spherical harmonic sense. In a spherical harmonic sense, yeah, and I realized I, I actually had this point addressed in an earlier slide, but I skipped over it. Yeah, so that's here. I told you Cooper pairs have an energy gap, and what I wanted to say here is often this picture that I showed you before is called S wave, but formally it belongs to an A1G uh, representation. So there is this, so you're right, we're implicitly referring to spherical harmonics, but in practice, no crystal has spherical symmetry. And so this becomes sort of just a, uh, just a code word. And so we imagine, and formally what it actually means is we're in the A1G representation, which is something I'll get back to later. Right. Okay. So the usual S-wave state is unstable, but then there's a famous paper by Conan Luttinger back from ages ago who showed that even if we have such a repulsive interaction, you can get, give the rise to superconductivity. And in fact, even for, uh, for you can derive some BCS-like interaction that's attractive, but the only condition that comes from this is now the uh, superconductivity has to have sign changes in the gap. If it has sign changes in the gap, you can see how this condition is satisfied. We can have positive regions for this gap and the negative regions for this gap, so the total sum is zero. So cohn luttinger showed that there is still a generic instability to superconductivity even when we have these repulsive interactions. And I won't go into the details of that, but that's important for understanding these materials. So the key new result from that is that, in principle, the superconducting wave function has to have these sign changes. All right, so let's see how these sign changes manifest themselves. So let's first go to this corner junction experiment that I showed you before. All right, so this is a Josephson junction. And as I told you, if we apply a magnetic field through the junction, we expect to see this critical current suppressed. And what um, Dale Van Harlingen's group saw was instead it increases. And okay, this is not the standard junction geometry because we do have a corner, so we have one junction here and another junction here. But we can imagine that if we have what is known as an S-wave superconductor, so that the gap is everywhere the same, then we can see that the Josephson current here and the Josephson current here will be the same. Right? And so we expect to get this behavior for this uh, kind of junction. However, whoops, we can now consider a superconductor with a sign change in the wave function. And so here is the famous D wave superconductor of the high temperature superconductors. And here what I've depicted is a wave function that is positive in this direction and negative in this direction. And now this phase difference needs to reveal itself in some way. And it shows up in this difference here. Uh, I won't go through the details, but qualitatively you can see that in this region we can imagine that there is a usual junction, but because of the sign change here, we have a critical current J that floats through, flows in this direction, but in this direction, because of the sign change, the opposite current flows. And now we can have a possibility that if this length and this length are exactly equal, the total current flowing through this junction will be zero. And in fact, that's the prediction. And then if we happen to make this length and this length not exactly equal, then we'll get something that looks like this. Can you yeah. clarify the yellow part? Is, that's just an S-wave. Yeah, this, sorry, I should clarify. This is an S-wave superconductor everywhere, all right? 
When I should have probably made it black to be consistent with these pictures. So here I have negative as yellow and black as positive. Yeah, so here this Joseph's injunction gives a positive phase, this Joseph's injunction gives a negative phase only due to this material here. Okay? And so this experiment was one of the first experiments to convincingly show that these high temperature cuprates are actually not S wave superconductors, but are this kind of D wave superconductivity. Now this is a real space picture, and I want to now turn back to momentum space and go back to the origin of Cooper pairs a little bit more carefully and try to understand some more fundamental pro properties. Right. So Cooper showed that this Fermi C is unstable to the formation of Cooper pairs. Um, and there's some caveats in here. So Implicitly, I've been taking through it, I have, a fermion on the, I have a fermion that sits on the Fermi surface, that pairs with another fermion on the Fermi surface. And implicitly, I've been saying, well, the Cooper pair forms a molecule, and that molecule is stationary, meaning that the momentum K for this fermion, and, and this fermion has momentum minus K, and both these two fermions sit on the Fermi surface. So if we have one state with momentum K on the Fermi surface, we need to have a second state at momentum minus K that's also on the Fermi surface. And we want this to be true for all momentum. All right? And this is the usual S-wave picture I've been showing before. Here's what happens in the D-wave case, and I'll explain this in just a second. But it turns out that if we want to be sure that states with momentum K and minus K are both sitting on the Fermi surface, then we need to have symmetries. In fact, there's only two symmetries in three dimensions that lets this happen. One is inversion symmetry, which takes momentum k to minus k, and the second is time reversal symmetry that takes k to minus k. And if we have neither of these two symmetries, if they're not present, we're not going to get a Cooper instability, there will not be superconductivity for arbitrarily weak interactions, and so we won't have a superconducting state anymore. So these symmetries are essential to forming superconductivity. An interesting feature of that, which you may be familiar with in quantum mechanics, is if we look at the product of inversion and time reversal, we remember that inversion is a usual symmetry operation, time reversal is an anti-unitary symmetry operation, so it, um, and because it's anti-unitary, we know that this product, when squared, must equal to minus one. This is something you've seen for spin one-half fermions in your quantum mechanics courses. And because you have this feature that this operator squares to minus one, this guarantees that on this Fermi surface at each momentum k we have a two-fold degeneracy, and that two-fold degeneracy we understand as spin up and spin down. All right. So here we're going into some more solid formation from the formation of Cooper pairs. We need to have these two symmetries or one of these two symmetries. And then also, if we have both these two symmetries, which I'll assume throughout the talk in the normal state, we have these symmetries, then we're going to form, uh, we're going to have a double degeneracy at each k here, one for spin up and one for spin down fermions. And that's a very general statement that follows from this. Okay, now back to this D-wave picture. So here, before I was showing these red lines depicting kind of the fermions that are gapped, a traditional picture of superconductivity is to show the magnitude of the gap at each k. And so here I'm showing a gap defined on the Fermi surface. And in this region then, in this direction, it's very big. And here red means positive, yellow means negative. And then you can see the gap gets smaller as we get to this point, vanishes here, and then changes sign and comes around. But you notice we get these vanishing points in the superconducting wave function in momentum space. And that's also going to play an important role in understanding these, ma these materials. All right. Okay. So. We have a two-fold degeneracy at each momentum k. I have two states here, I have two states here. I'm going to start making Cooper pairs from these two states there and these two states here. And you can see that because we have two states up there and two states down there, in principle, we're going to be able to make four types of Cooper pairs. All right? We can imagine a k, a k up and minus k down, or k up and minus k up and vice versa. So there's four types of Cooper pairs we can make with these two states here and these two states here. And it turns out the conditions of um, inversion and time reversal symmetry actually tells us a lot about what's happening in these, um, uh, about the structure of these Cooper pairs. And so traditionally we parameterize these Cooper pairs by this two by two matrix. So it's defined at each k, but now I'm worrying about the spin dependence, s and s prime. These can be both up and down. And so here I've shown the characteristic spin singlet superconductivity. This says up, down, minus, down, up. 
psi of k and minus psi of k, so this corresponds to a spin singlet Cooper pair, and we describe it by this scalar function, and often this is written by this i sigma y, which is just this matrix 0, 0, 1, minus 1 times the psi of k. Now an important feature is because we're pairing two fermions, we have to be sure that our Cooper pair satisfies Pauli exclusion, meaning if I interchange those two fermions, the wave function must change sign. And so in this particular case then is if we interchange the two fermions, we take k to minus k and we switch to two spins. And so because this is a spin singlet, the anti-symmetry of this uh, um, um, poly condition is encoded in the spin structure of the wave function. And that says in momentum space then, this must be an even function of momentum space. So the total Cooper pair wave function is anti-symmetric. It's anti-symmetric because it's a spin singlet, and so in momentum space, it must satisfy uh, and it's unchanged under k goes to minus k. But then, of course, there's this other possibility. We can make spin triplet Cooper pairs, meaning we can, for example, pair a state at k with spin up, and another with minus k also with spin up. And I'm not going to focus a lot on these spin triplet Cooper pairs throughout the talk, but it is relevant for this uranium tellurium 2. In particular, when I told you before, okay, well, there's, if we make spin triplet, we can see there's three types of spin triplet. Here the wave function is symmetric in spin space, so if I interchange the two spins, I get the same wave function back in spin space. And so to satisfy Pauli exclusion, that means that the, this um, spin triplet wave function must be anti-symmetric in momentum space. So I go from k to minus k, I must pick up a minus sign. And we'll see some examples of this in a second. Now this is important because it explains this behavior I showed you in uranium tellurium 2. So I told you, you saw that superconductivity exists at the fields far above the field usually needed to suppress superconductivity. Well, the explanation lies in the fact that what I told you before applied to spin singlet superconductors, but now you spin triplet superconductors, you can see a spin triplet superconductor can respond to fields. So we would expect a finite spin susceptibility at zero temperature, but also we can imagine that this will not be affected by fields as much. And indeed, that is the case in this material. And that's why you can far exceed these poly fields. So this is general analysis with just time reversal inversion symmetry tells you you've spin singlet and spin triplet superconductors. And these spin triplet superconductors do exist in nature. Uh, yeah. I guess I, we can understand the that function delta is an energy gap between normal state and spawning state is called right? How can we understand the vector of primary T and how can it experimental access that? Yeah, um, okay, that's a good question. I, uh, honestly, I didn't spend a lot of time on that, but I can, so I'll, I'll tell you, so you'll see a little bit of the explanation. So this vector order parameter D will give rise to an energy gap that I'll show you probably in the next lecture. Um, so you can measure a gap corresponding to it. It also, in terms of answering your question, it turns out this shares the same symmetry property as a spin vector, meaning if I do a spin rotation, this rotates like uh, a spin. And that means that its spin properties can be probed. And so one way you can see it is in response to magnetic fields. Because it's a spin-like object, it will respond to magnetic fields. And so the fact that you see these critical fields that far exceed this poly field is an indication that it's spin triplet, and also in spin susceptibility. And you can, get, you can even become more careful. You can make Joseph's injunctions that start to probe this, but it becomes much more, so there, I won't explain that in detail here, but in principle, you can start to probe some of these effects as well. Yeah. Yeah. But usually what you see is the energy gap, which loosely speaking is basically the square root of the vector of d dot d. Okay, that's what you usually see. Okay, that sounds good. Uh, all right, let me, okay, I'll, I'll, I think I've got a good stopping point. All right, so I'm going now into more careful descriptions of Cooper pairs. And so in that, we have to use the fact that a crystal has additional symmetries in addition to time reversal and inversion symmetry. And so I told you already, these time reversal inversion are essential to guarantee that we have a superconducting instability, but we also have other symmetries, and these other symmetries are used to further classify the Cooper pairs from spin triplet and spin singlet. And I think what I'll do then is just go through um, 
maybe introduce this slide and the next slide, and then we'll make that a good stopping point. All right, so here, actually, maybe I'll just do this slide because this takes actually a little more explanation. Because we have symmetries and we're classifying Cooper pairs as a um, phase transition corresponding to broken symmetry, it turns out the proper characterization of superconductivity is through the Landau theory of phase transitions, which means that we have to define a symmetry breaking order parameter. And this depends in particular on the behavior of the order parameter under particular symmetries of our group. And so here I've shown a character table which you don't need to understand in detail, but some aspects I'll talk about later on. But here I have the character table for the group D4, which is the symmetries of a square. All right, so a square has fourfold rotation symmetries, and then also has a series of twofold rotation symmetries. So if this, imagine my hand is a square, this would be one two-fold rotation symmetry that's characterized by these elements here. So I've drawn that picture. There's a four-fold rotation symmetry, and then there's these two-fold rotation symmetries of axes which I rotate about. Okay. Now here, in principle, if we have parity as well, we have even and odd parity representations. I'm not focusing on that here. But it turns out that these character tables, especially for these so-called one-dimensional representations, completely specify the nature of the Cooper pair wave function. So I told you before we had a D-wave superconductor. It turns out this D-wave superconductor exists in a material with tetragonal symmetry, or the symmetry properties of a square. And here's the picture I showed you before with this plus and minus sign. In fact, we can understand this plus and minus sign from this particular representation. So here, if I look at this picture, I imagine doing a fourfold rotation around here. This black goes to yellow and vice versa, and that means we get a sign change in the superconducting order parameter. And so I look down this column for the behavior of the order parameter under this fourfold rotation, we see here we have a minus one. So under that fourfold rotation, we expect to see a minus one. So this picture is consistent with this representation. And in general, these representations are what characterize the superconducting wave functions, and these are what define them. These minus ones play an important role, as I'll explain later on. In particular, the minus one is what guarantees that the superconducting gap goes to zero in certain places. So even though, though we draw pictures, we're understanding this particular choice here, or this particular behavior. And notice here, this is the usual S-wave superconductor. It simply says that under every symmetry transformation, the superconducting gap is unchanged, right? So it picks up a one under everything, so it looks the same in all directions in space, right? And then finally, we do have even and odd. It turns out even odd parity representations are labeled by G for even parity and U for odd parity. And okay, so with that, Okay, maybe this one last slide just to so, so you see how this relates. So we then go from this formal group theory understanding of what superconductive is to the pictures we like to use to give us mental constructs. And for even parity superconductors, we imagine that we have a, delta, a gap function that's described by some scalar psi of k times a spin singlet part. And then as I mentioned before, we typically give some characteristic type of momentum dependence for this scalar part around the Fermi surface. So we typically imagine that we have a gap only defined on the Fermi surface. It behaves like kx squared minus ky squared, say. So in this direction, we have kx, so it's positive and large. But then when kx equals ky, it vanishes. And when we have in this direction ky, we have something that's positive, is negative and large, and gives us this characteristic behavior describing the gap around the Fermi surface. And so we have a k-dependent, and we can generalize that to multi-band systems. So if we imagine we have two bands, so here there's two Fermi surfaces, and we can have a gap function on both of these that's big in some directions and then vanishes in some points here. And then we can have a conventional superconductor, which is psi k is everywhere constant. And then finally we can have, uh, and this will be my last point, we can actually have more complex structures, and I'll show you where this comes from uh, in the next lecture. So here's a, a characteristic wave function in three dimensions that looks like kz kx plus i ky. This i is important because it now this Cooper pair carries angular momentum. Because it carries angular momentum, it actually breaks time reversal symmetry. And this means that now, because it breaks time reversal symmetry, it can allow for a polar curve effect to appear. And so it begins to explain where we see the polar curve from. And we'll look at this example again in, some, uh, in, in a little bit more detail later on. So I think I'll stop there. And then we'll go more with this sort of formal definition of Cooper pairs. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.